So we're sitting here with uh, two of the original members of Flamingos, Zeke Carey and Jake Carey. I'd like to let uh, Zeke give you a little background on the history of the Flamingos and how they started. Oh, wow. Uh, of course, uh, the Flamingos started in uh, Chicago. And um, <clears throat> Jake and I, uh, it was sort of a childhood dream of ours to... Uh, have a group and um, we began um, our career was launched I would say uh, through a talent show that no one showed up for the show but us and of course uh, as Jake has, has often said uh, we had to win That's good because way. you know so anyway, it so happened that there uh, was a, a, an agent in the audience that uh, heard the group and uh, uh, apparently recognized uh, the potential and uh, he came and talked to us and, and uh, he wanted to uh, introduce us to uh, uh, the president of an agency, a very new agency, uh, who uh, was named Ralph Leon, who later became our personal manager. And uh, he began to, uh, you know, allow us to work or book us in uh, clubs around Chicago. And uh, we worked with a lot of the great acts then, well, uh, well, one of the greats now that we worked with at those years was, of course, uh, uh, Joe Williams. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Count Basie. Yeah, man. Count Basie, yeah, Count Basie, Joe Williams. And uh, we began to learn and develop uh, for about a year before we ever made a f our first record. Uh, and uh, I would have to say that that was basically the way the Flamingo started. Mm hmm you know. A lot of your uh, early material is highly sought after. I know that the Chance records are few and far between. Finding uh, something like Golden Teardrops and finding some of the Parrot uh, records are incredible. I know that I Really Don't Want to Know is one of the most sought after of all rock and roll, rhythm, blues type records. Uh, you had Dream of a Lifetime on there, which is just an incredible song, too. Uh, from a collector's viewpoint, your records are very valuable and very sought after, and I think part of it is because you were the roots, part of the roots of rhythm and blues that came across uh, into the rock and roll era. It stemmed, I guess, initially from the Ink Spots and the Mills Brothers, and the Ravens and groups like this, and you took that four-part vocalized harmony and added a lead singer to it rather than featuring a bass. Uh, Jacob, what do you remember about the early years? I know that Nate Nelson joined you in about <clears throat> 54, and he had a, a beautiful voice. The years of struggle. Mm, I'm sure. The struggle, struggle, struggle. Man, when you figure about how you try to put it together and put it into a type of a capsule where you can say, hey man, we're going to make this uh, as a thing so we can present it to the public, it was rough. Mm -hmm. Well, part of what had to help you, uh, actually, and it doesn't seem fair to you fellas, but uh, you had a group that put a, a beautiful song together, I'll Be Home, okay? Yes. And then Pat Boone took that song and then brought it up to number five on the national charts, but I think that it did give you the national exposure uh, it, and of course, a guy like Alan Freed was, in New York City only was played a blessing, your version. It was a blessing in disguise. Well, and also you went from uh, Checker, 
which was still, even though it had a lot of uh, good artists on its label, from there you went over to DECA, which was a national label. Yeah. And with DECA, uh, you didn't do that well. You had a beautiful uh, record that almost uh, hit the charts, Ladder of Love, which uh, Johnny Nash also did. Yeah. He had a few other things, but you finally started putting it all together when you went to End Records, and once again... Uh, the standard was part of your repertoire. Zeke, why don't you tell us about that? A little bit? Let me let me uh, uh, backtrack just a bit uh, and deal with a little bit of the history of uh, of what was going on at that particular time. Now, prior to the end days, during the uh, the Pat Boone, Georgia Gibbs, uh, and uh, uh, Bill Haley, right. Now, what was happening in those days, uh, uh, just before rock and roll, uh, naturally a corn phrase by Alan Freed, became uh, an acceptable music for top 40 radio. Before that, there was the, of course, the rhythm and blues stations uh, in which... Uh, uh, black artists, black recording artists were restricted, you know, to, uh, in other words, if you wanted your records played on what you call so-called pop, popular or top 40 stations today, if you wanted that, uh, it was something that was, uh, was sort of off limits to black artists at the time. And so what would happen is, once the Pat Boones and uh, the Georgia Gibbs uh, uh, found, discovered a hit, you understand, by a black artist from, uh, you know, in the black uh, a marketplace, uh, they would automatically cover that record knowing that they had a hit, mm -hmm. you understand? So they didn't have to worry about whether or not it was a hit, whether it was in the song. All they had to do was just copy the tune and right away, you know, this happened to I'll Be Home, this happened to uh, with the, by the Flamingos, this happened to Sincerely uh, with the McGuire Sisters covered uh, by the Moonglows. Uh, this happened to... Uh, uh, well, Pat Boone, of course, you know, he covered sure. uh, Fats Domino, Ain't That a Shame. McGuire and, sister yeah, did it yeah, a few yeah, times. Of course. Good Night, Sweetheart. Right. Good Night, night Sweetheart yeah. with, the, oh, with uh, Pookie Hudson and the, and the Spaniels. Right. So what happened was, is uh, uh, when we got to end records, the barrier, you know, the, the, the wall had begun to crumble. And a, I think a, you know, if you have, if you've seen American Hot Wax, you would get the message. What happened was that the uh, the uh, uh, controllers, the power structure, as far as the music was concerned, the ones who control the airways in the major radio stations just began to accept the fact that rock and roll was going, wasn't going to go anywhere, it was going to stay, and it might as well play it anyway. Right. You understand? And in a sense, in trying to avoid it, you understand? And I think there was a big meeting uh, among uh, the record companies at that time, uh, the, uh, the the small record companies such as the Chesses and uh, and other independent labels begin to complain about what the major uh, record companies such as Decca and, and the Capitol and Columbia were doing, mm -hmm. how they were just knocking them totally out of the box, and they was fight they fought for some fair play and air play. And uh, that allowed us, when we came along with, uh, we were able to survive the era of the Albany Homes, of the major covers, the artists began to cover, where we were able to survive, that many artists weren't able to. 
and of course we were along with of course the uh, Fats Domino and people like that uh, and when in, we began to record on N Records and Barry was gone and they could take the Flamingos and uh, other black groups black artists record right straight to the big pop stations with no problem if it was in the grooves they would play it right. and uh, uh, that was the one thing that helped us a lot when we got on in records but that's just sort of uh, how it came about it's sort of sort of some uh, history of what really went down how things changed mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that we were able to survive the change is why we had the tremendous success on in records mm -hmm. which was very successful in a, a matter yes. of uh, yeah. two or three years you had nine chart records which were just incredible songs and all of a sudden in the middle of those uh, songs beautiful ballads that we uh, we expect a flamingo's record to come out and it's just a classic ballad up comes nobody loves me. Like you. How, <laughs> yes. how did that come about? Today? That came about by a mere coincidence. Uh, George Goldner thought so little of the tune. See, being surrounded by a a, a, a what you call a a whole barrier or a masses of ballads. All our releases up to that point were ballads. Mm -hmm. And so he said, he said, hey, y'all, go take it. So we took the tune. We put it in. You mean, even, even at that time, we were thinking, uh, uh, we were thinking uh, in the enterprising uh, manner, we had put it into our company. Mm -hmm. Amen, because he thought he, hey man, this thing ain't gonna happen. He said, "Okay, go ahead and take the tune." So, uh, Sam uh, Sam Cook wrote the That's tune an for incredible us. Incredible thing. And so, when he put the thing out, when he put the tune out, when he released, nobody loved me like you do. Man, he almost had a quiet heart attack. Uh -huh. <laughs> man, sure. that tune, just like that. Right. And that's a that's a fantastic song. It's one of the all time great up tempo records that I remember from the fifties. I really, I really enjoy a record like that. That that actually was about nineteen sixty, wasn't it? That that came out. It came out. Uh, uh, yes, it was nineteen sixty. Mm -hmm. Well, it was recorded originally in an album called "Request of Lee Yours," and. Uh, it was recorded in 59, but released as a single, I think, in 60. Right. And that, uh, when it Great hit, record. yeah. You do a, a number in your show, I Believe in Music, and I think you fellas really do, because you're still surviving. You can do anything. I, I certainly enjoy listening to your shows, and uh, I enjoy the way you uh, adapt to change and so forth, yeah. and I know that uh, we're going to hear more from you. Well, we're going to keep on hanging in there. We, we are nearing the 80s, and uh, we realize that uh, music is going to change again, and we're going to do it. That's great. We're going to hang in there. I'd like to yeah, thank yeah. you very much, both of you, for coming by. Jacob, yeah. thank you very much. Zeke, thank you My very pleasure. much. The Flamingos, thank you.